Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And it's great to see this turnout for You're Gonna Have a Treat. And it is a really great pleasure to introduce this movie to you. Uh, and I won't, no spoiler alerts, I'm not gonna tell you how it ends. Um, but this, uh, this movie, well, it resonates for me in a very particular way because uh, it's about, it's in that unusual category, the Astronomy Road movie. You probably, <laughs> you probably haven't seen very many of those. Um, and it features four quirky Brits. I realize that phrase may be a tautology. Um, well, my accent got sort of terraformed by moving around the world when I was young, but I'm a transplanted Brit, and so the, the big resonance of this movie for me is that when I was a first year grad student, 21 years old, I was in Edinburgh doing my PhD, and you know, there's the usual pluses and minuses of living in Scotland, you know, there's you know, golf and whiskey and soccer and there's clouds and rain and kind of door people all around you. Um, and I got a chance to come out here as a graduate student and I had never been to the Western US. So I had my own sort of, you know, version of this experience coming out here from Edinburgh in the midwinter where if you've been to Edinburgh in the winter, for a few months the sun is just doing this little sort of glancing thing above the horizon for a couple of hours. But that's kind of moot because there are clouds and it's raining anyway, so you don't actually see the sun. And they came out here and there were these incredible skies and this fabulous sense of space and these great observatories. And to make a, another nice little connection to the movie, I also encountered the Jesuit astronomers and I stayed in their residence and you know they cooked homemade enchiladas and they had a well-stocked wine cellar and liquor cabinet and a swimming pool and a spa and I was thinking, this Jesuit thing's not too bad. And Alison Rose, the director of this movie, made the same realization, because her first movie, Galileo's Sons, is about the Jesuit astronomers. And her second movie's totally different again, Love at the Starlight Motel. You just unilaterally recommend all her movies for your attention. Um, so this, this movie means a lot to me. I know all the people involved. When I came out here as a young grad student, I met Nick Wolf and uh, the people at Stewart Observatory, who I was meeting for the first time, said, Nick's our ideas guy. You know, he's like the big ideas guy. And this was one of the top ranked astronomy programs in the country and the world, you know, and everyone around the building was full of ideas. So if this is the ideas guy, then we're talking a lot of ideas. So the short story is that Nick, as one of my colleagues, proudly a colleague for 30 years, and Allison, who I've known for probably 15 years, are two of the most creative people I've ever met or known. And, and I think you'll truly enjoy the work you're about to see. Thank you. Okay, well, just imagine this is the living room and a very informal setting, and I'm sure they'll happily take your questions. So. And have a conversation. Yeah, start up front. A lot of we, I think we have a roving, do we have a roving mic or? No, I'm just saying. Oh, we'll, we'll repeat the question. Nick, we, we can, can you just repeat it? Yeah, yeah. A lot of this is about our place in the universe. And lately there's been Tabby's star, and it's been in the news with a TED Talk, Kickstarter campaign, this Russian SETI signal recently, even Leslie Kane's UFO book, the Michio Kaku was into. What's the intersection of the science with public perception with this stuff? Okay, that's a good, a complex question. So there's been issues in the media, the radio detection of possible intelligence signal, other inklings that we may not be alone in the universe in terms of intelligent life. Nick had some comments on that in the film. So it's a question of how the the potential science of extraterrestrial intelligence, if you like, intersects with 
you know, the, the popular culture version of it. I think we should be looking, looking much closer. We are at an extraordinary time. Nick, hold it a little closer. Hello? Hold it closer. Okay. Uh, I think we are living in an extraordinary time here, and we're paying too much attention to the outside, because what is happening is that we are at the intersection of two different kinds of life, biological life, which we have carried forward to here, and post-biological life, electronic life, which is in the process of coming into being, brought into being by us as a totally new kind of life in the universe. And it is much more exciting to watch that happening than anything that we have a chance of seeing outside. Another way to put this is that at the moment, you, you know, you think you own your iPhone if it's a 6 or a 7. By the time it's an 11 or 12, the roles might start to reverse. <laughs> Another way of looking at it is that even though we sent people to the moon, for quite a while now, the furthest we've sent them is a couple of hundred miles above the Earth, whereas the electronic parts that are going to be more lifelike as time goes by are roving around on Mars and have visited uh, satellites of planets, have gone out past, beyond, past Pluto and are exploring things that we would never have thought we could have learned about. Um, more questions? Yes. I'm just curious, uh, why do you rate the telescope that's in the Akama Desert down in Chile? I heard you quite the show there. For Allison, why is there funding from Canada, but I didn't see any from Canal 4, for instance, from Europe? Just a question. Okay, we'll, we'll deal with those in two parts. Um, the, there's a question about how the telescopes in the, in the Atacama Desert rank compared to the telescopes in the, in the film, or name. There are different things that you see from the north and the south, and putting, putting the pieces together of the north and the south make a complete sky. There are closer things uh, of one kind here, closer things of another kind there. And you have to take advantage of both of them, so you need big telescopes that can see both parts of the sky, and because of the way that the Earth rotates, the things that can be seen from the south can't be seen from the north, and the things that can be seen from the north can't be seen from the south. We have to have telescopes in both hemispheres. And the question for Allison was sort of about the funding of a bill and how, how it's pieced together and where it comes from. Well, I'm a Canadian, and <clears throat> the way you finance documentaries, typically in Canada, at least until now, is that you get a Canadian broadcaster, and then that broadcasting funding triggers other funding that we can apply for. Um, I didn't, I didn't have much success pursuing funding in Europe. Uh, and, um, and, and the UK. I would love to have had it commissioned in the UK. It's been acquired by the BBC uh, for an amazingly small amount of money. <laughs> amazingly, like less than 2% of the budget. But it's leading the This Week on the BBC, and it's going to be shown there on the, it's at the end of the month. It's coming up on the BBC. It's an hour-long version of this film, so they've cut a half hour out of it. Um, that, 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 anyway, it's a, and they did a fantastic job, I have to say. Uh, I'm really happy with the cut down. But um, I'm happy to answer more questions that you may have about financing. But, so the Brits are always freeloading, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I thought it was curious that uh, nothing at all was said about the families of any of these men. It was like they had no social context whatsoever. They <laughs> dropped on my planet and made this trip. Was that a deliberate decision on your part? Oh, I know. Uh, I'll repeat the question. It was about uh, the, these... Uh, these four men seem to have no family or other, you know, parts to their existence. 
you know, and I'm a woman, <laughs> and I'm very conscious of women's roles in historically. There's only so many stories you can tell in an hour and a half, and when you have four characters, you just you run out of bandwidth. So I'd like to make a film about women astronomers, and I'm looking for that story now. Um, any other other one of the questions? Yes. It's a question to Nick about how he feels about Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX. And, and his idea that he wants to go to Mars. In fact, he said he wants to die on Mars, I think. Biosphere 2 was an extraordinarily important experiment, and I have great admiration for the people who were in it. They learned one thing, which is important, which is that you can't exactly plan where the gases of an atmosphere will go, so that the oxygen that they hoped to breathe got instead breathed in by worms, largely, and the carbon dioxide that came out and was supposed to get recycled went into concrete. So uh, that was a tricky part. The part that they missed is the long-term part, what's called the area-species relationship, that you need a huge area to maintain a single species for a long period of time. And if you transfer those ideas to somewhere like Mars, it means that you need uh, many square miles protected from cosmic rays by a, an amount of matter about a ton per square meter. It's an incredible uh, thought that you could possibly consider doing it, and I'm sorry, Mr. Musk doesn't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, back in the middle. I was very impressed with the photography. Was it done mostly by a single photographer, or were there multiple people doing the various uh, just photographic artistry? The question is about uh, how the photography was done in the, in the film. So most of the cinematography is done by one person named Daniel Grant. Um, I did some cinematography, uh, and um, and the astrophotography was done by an amateur astrophotographer and amateur astronomer from Canada named Malcolm Park, who came with us, followed us. And when we would leave a site, he would come in and set up, and he would shoot the night sky uh, while we moved on to the next location. So most of the work, most of that cinematography was done by Daniel Grant, and the night skies were shot by Malcolm Park. And I got the jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, back, back here, two thirds of the way back. I'm going to take advantage of this. I, I know you, Nick, and you were described at the beginning as a visionary. Do you have visions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, but I have has, to choose very go to asking if Nick has visions. Yes, yes uh, I, I have uh, on occasion seen things that aren't there and know that I was seeing things that weren't there. And I think it's part of the creative process of imagination to be able to see them. And I'll point out, however, that you never admit that in your NSF proposals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Back, back there, standing up. Two questions. First of all, I want to compliment the filmmaker. I originally worked for Educational TV Ontario on Fast Forward in the 80s, and uh, so I admire this level of filmmaking. I'd like to know how much was planned out ahead, and how did you keep from getting into the muck of what's adaptive optics, and you brought out the personalities of these people, um, so I'd like to know your process. And the second thing is, is for our astrophysicists, um, how did you go through this whole thing and go back and remember, and what was the experience like for you? So the question for Allison is just how, how the film is constructed as a narrative, I guess. 
and also when the subject matter is fairly technical, how do you keep it in perspective? Because some of the subject matter could have been very technical. So the process for filming was that I very deliberately focused on their relationships and on their personalities. And I learned about the science afterwards. And that was very risky. It was a, you know, it was arguably a mistake, but that's what I did. I really wanted to just capture the reunion and the friendship. And, and I decided I would learn about the science afterwards. I do actually think that was irresponsible, but. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and the question for Nick was about in the, you know, in the sort of interview, in the sort of uh, chronology, you're being asked about things that have already happened or whatever. So is, was the chronological aspect difficult for you or not? No, I, ha I had no difficulty, uh, but I did very much appreciate the work that Alison had to do. That film was cut twice. That it was sufficiently difficult to piece together a story through it. That it was done once and then decided that should be discarded and the pieces picked up and put together again. I think it was absolutely essential, but I realized it was a very hard task and I'm very appreciative of the way that this film has been put together. It's, it's true, it's a deceptively simple film. It was very, very, very hard to make. And perhaps the reason why the astronomy was not so crucial was that this was a bucket list project. <laughs> and uh, as such, that was what was carrying the story all the way that we were people doing something for the last time and knowing we were doing it for the last time and, and dealing with our relationships with one another as part of it. Now, that doesn't mean to say we were alone in the world because if anyone has ever seen my office, they will realize that I do not keep things well organized. And the only way that my life has been kept organized so that I've been able to do as much as I have is that I have a wife at home who does an awfully good job of keeping me organized. Uh, yes, yeah. okay. Just one question for the astrophysicist. During your period of discovery, how often did you have the feeling that you were being overwhelmed and you second, second guessed what you were, you were looking at? So the question for Nick about in the process of discovery as a scientist, how, how do you keep it? You know, how do you stop from being overwhelmed or how do you recognize what's important, I guess? The most important thing is, the most important thing is always the one that you haven't quite done yet. Uh, that's what keeps life interesting. Uh, what you discover is that everything is connected to everything else and other people haven't made all of those connections so when you start making those connections you're doing something interesting and that's how you follow the lead and, and it's just a continuous process of discovery and the way that I started off as a child by just reading everything and then hoping that it would start pulling into place meant that the places that hung out that didn't quite fit together were the ones that were the interesting ones where I needed to follow so it just kept following me along in that way throughout life and it still will until I, I finally reach that end state where I'm drooling. <laughs> uh, yes, over there. I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the science <laughs> yes, uh, Sorry, it's the not question really is English. about the, uh, the British reticence to hugging. Or maybe it's not just British. <laughs> My, did, you, did you notice how Roger and Donald said goodbye to Wall? And that was the last time they saw him. That was reserved. The second question I have was, for you as 
So the question is, though, was what was Alice's level of concern when Roger was clearly in trouble out there on the trail in the middle of nowhere? There's a complicated answer to that. Um, part of the answer is that we had no choice but to keep going. Uh, there was no, you know, once you're in it, you just have to get to the end. And in the way that Roger said, you know, I can't carry him, thinking of Donald when Donald was in trouble, we also had to just sort of forge ahead. And I, you know, that's why I stopped and listened and encouraged him gently. I wasn't so much worried that he would fall. I was very surprised. I was, I cannot overstate how surprised I was at Rogers, and to this day mystified, frankly, by his difficulty. But Donald was, you know, Donald had uh, high blood pressure, and he'd started taking a high blood pressure medication, and he was taking too much of it, and it meant that he couldn't actually climb. And he learned to reduce his dosage. But Roger was a mystery. Um, it, it was really totally surprising. Um, and I started putting electrolytes in their water because they, they one, I don't think they carried enough water. And they were like, they thought I was ridiculous carrying as much water as I was. Um, but I had read. You know, I, I have read the instructions and taken them seriously, and they tell you how much water to carry, as you know, living in Arizona. And so I was carrying that much water, plus more for them, but I, I started putting electrolytes in their water, and that may have helped. I think that there's a, a further comment on that is that Eric Erickson, the uh, psychiatrist, said that at this stage, the stage before the last of our life is the stage of wisdom, but Shakespeare said it's the stage of being a buffoon. And somewhere between the two of them, we, we managed to put it all together. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're, imagine you're observing that is not behind you, where do you want to look next? Where do I want to look next? With the telescopes or, you know, those capabilities. No, the, the, the telescopes are coming, are still coming along bigger and bigger and people are, are suddenly starting to appreciate that they need absolutely enormous ones if they want to look at planets around other stars. Uh, you consider having, having telescopes that are not tens of meters but hundreds of meters across and how you're going to handle the cost as well as everything else about them. So th there's a great future still for that. People will want to know about planets around other stars and they'll want to see what they look like, what's going on on them. We've, uh, we've looked at Earth to see, to get an idea of what it's like to look at a planet with life and we know that there's nothing like that in the solar system so our only chance is to look at planets around other stars but they are incredibly more dim than the star that they're very close to and that requires an incredible amount of telescope effort to observe them. I mean, I'll make a slight comment on that. The, as, as Allison alluded in the film, the, the Palomar 200 inch, many people thought it would be the largest telescope ever built. It was, it's a monumental telescope. Um, and the innovations of Roger Angel, the Mirror Lab, and, and Nick, were what broke the cost curve for telescopes because the cost of a mirror and the whole assembly had been going up as the 
two and a half or a third power of the size of the mirror, and that just makes them possibly expensive. So the fact that we have even larger telescopes is a testament to that ingenuity. And then, as Nick says, the sort of killer app for a telescope like the GMT that we're building for Chile is, is inspecting the habitability and possibly the microbial habitation of Earth-like planets. That's the killer app. That's the thing that will make the front page news if it happens. And, and within five to ten years, not that far off. Other questions? Yes, here. The questions about uh, given budgetary constraints and so on, what are the prospects of cooperation with the Chinese? The, the interesting question in cooperation is whether the people of the United States can learn to cooperate with each other. It's extraordinarily difficult, as we have, as we have seen uh, for the past 20 years or so, we've almost had a state of being incapable of doing things in Washington because one half of the people want to do something and the other half of the people don't. So how we're going to overcome that, I can't imagine. And until we learn how we're going to work together and do things, we aren't going to be able to start trying to cooperate with other countries. So it's a question of where Nick stands on the of the plausibility or likelihood of communication with other entities out there in the universe. I think it's extraordinarily hard for us to imagine it because the amount of communication that is needed is so great. When animal life developed on this planet, we learned to manage to have internal communication that works extraordinarily well. But if you look at and try to see how animals and us work together, we manage it with very, very little communication. And the great thing that will happen with electronic life forms is that they will have an incredibly greater and, and larger amount of communication when they're relatively close. The means of communicating at a distance hasn't yet been properly learned. Indeed, it may well be easier to send your equivalent of a thumb drive for your computer to another group than to send the same message by radio. Okay, maybe a couple more, and then we'll wrap up. Two. Yes. Oh, right at the back, yes. So that's an interesting question about whether in terms of seeing the universe as an intelligent entity or life without humans, whether we're even asking the right questions. We have no idea uh, what the quote right of right question is. Uh, we see the universe, we try to understand how we survive in it, because that is uh, our, our need. We were created as a Darwinian species, as a survival species, uh, and so all our learning has been based on, if you know more, you have a better chance of surviving. Now, we don't know what other questions the universe may be posing, and so we have no idea even how to start asking the question as to what that, what that, that might be. Okay. Yes, at the back. For Allison, as a 
filmmaker, I, I'm curious when you started the project, what you were hoping the narrative would end up being, and did it come close to what you thought it was going to be? Did it go completely in a different direction? Did it exceed expectations? So that's a great question about what Allison thought the narrative might be going in and how it panned out in practice. I, I didn't have a vision for a narrative. I didn't have a vision for a narrative arc, I would say, but this film is exactly what I felt. This is what, this is what I wanted. It, it, it's the emotional resonance of this film that I believed in. And uh, believed within in the, that idea, the idea of the road trip. I, I'm happy to talk to you more about that, um, but I can't, I couldn't sort of see, I was confident there was a narrative arc, just purely technically, structurally, I knew that the road trip would give us an arc, uh, a spine that we could build off of. And I trusted what I, what I was hoping for what, and I knew that I could ask, that this was a means of asking these big questions, because that's really what interests me. Um, and I, but I didn't know about the strength of their relationship, and I didn't know what would come of that. I, I, I guess I was just sort of hoping, or I, um, I guess I just trusted my instinct that it was a really good story and that I should go with them. Okay, I think that's a good place to finish. Oh, but before everyone disperses, uh, it is actually, are we ready for this yeah. job? Yes. Can I, can I just, before you do this, I, it struck me, I've watched this film a lot with a lot of audiences, and I cannot overstate how much it meant to me tonight to watch it with you. So much of the landscape of that film is the landscape of your home. You know, the sun setting at the end, did you notice the saguaro cacti? Yeah. So that, we shot that not far from here. And that time lapse of the city when Nick talks about the future of life, the, you know, what the risk is, that's Tucson. Um, it just, I, I am so grateful to you, Jeff for the invitation to screen here. And I must say that um, there's a very special reason that this screening is happening here tonight. I called Nick, I know Nick and my brother share a birthday and that birthday is tomorrow. And Nick asked for this screening for his birthday. So the US premiere is in Tucson, Arizona, not just because this is the place this film was supposed to be seen, but because it's Nick's birthday. Okay, it's 84 for those that want to sing. <laughs> and we'd like to sing happy birthday. And we'd like to share some birthday cake with you. Yeah, and thank God, I thank God that Nick was born. So let's sing happy birthday. Who wants to start? Happy birthday.